very much uh, for that nice introduction, and thank you all for coming. Um, I, I got worried when I went to college that if it was too sunny and nice, I would never show up for class. So extra credit for coming on such a lovely evening. Um, I am so glad to be here with you this evening. And what you just heard about my uh, quick yes to the invitation, um, two things about that. One is I always have my default be no. So just so you know, it's very unusual. Um, but I am a fan of what you're doing here and of Maria. And, and so I think it's just, um, for me, I wanted to see what this secret sauce was all about, of what you're doing down here. So um, I happily accepted the invitation. I'm also a California native, born in Napa, unusually. And um, my husband Nick and I have come to love Seattle. Um, but this state is where I'm from, and so my heart's in California, and I'm happy to be here, especially mid-February. Uh, so so I, I want to have a conversation, and I'm looking forward to question and answer time. Um, but I wanted to, to talk um, for a few minutes before we do have question and answer about something that's near and dear to my heart, and that is leadership, innovation, and impact. Um, specifically, I want to talk about um, one very specific aspect of this topic, and that is how organizations and their leaders can translate good ideas and innovation into useful impact. Now, you've got a bunch of brainiacs roaming around the, this area, and I've always loved working with really smart, talented people. Um, but I love working with smart, talented people when the impact is is so real and so meaningful. And so um, I want to tell you a little bit about um, why I think what I have to say might be valuable to you and to this institution. So I love history, and so I did a little Google search on you guys. Uh, and I found it fascinating that Harvey Med College opened its doors in September of 1957. I know you started the concept, the light bulb was 1955. Um, but September 57 is important for a couple of reasons. Um, less than a month after that, the Soviet Union launched Sputnik 1, inaugurating the space age. So Harvey Mudd and Sputnik 1 uh, were kind of joined at the hip. But you might not have known that in August of 1957, I was born. <laughs> so Harvey Mudd, Sputnik, and me. <laughs> now, seriously, I, I, I was telling my husband last night, a liberal arts college of engineering? He said, isn't that an oxymoron? Isn't there something wrong with that? So I said, no, no, it's right here. I Google searched it. <laughs> right here in Southern California, a true hotbed of the post-World War II aerospace industry. So really a coming together of seminal events. In that autumn of 1957, there was nothing abstract about the link between innovation and impact, not for those first students and professors here at Harvey Mudd, or for the nation as a whole. All of a sudden, the American people developed a sense of urgency about innovation, the kind of innovation that could produce swift and measurable results, the kind of innovation that could launch satellites of their own and place human beings on the moon. I found this history compelling because we, too, live in an era where there's an urgent need for innovation with impact. I'm thinking about innovation with impact a lot these days, and about history a lot. This year marks the 15th anniversary of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. I'm a big believer in the value of seizing milestones like this. I said I'd have to give my chancellor credentials back if I didn't take advantage of an anniversary. Milestones are an opportunity to take stock, to learn from the past and celebrate our accomplishments, and even more importantly, to plan for the future. This moment of self-assessment revolves around a question of impact. When they write the book about the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, have we made as much impact as we should? Are the choices we're making right now putting us in a better position to make an impact? No private organization has ever tried to address the kinds of problems we're working on. When I tell my mom and dad what I'm up to, or my friends what our ambitions are, global health, solve polio, eradicate malaria, fix TB, HIV, AIDS, agriculture, <coughs> water sanitation and hygiene. 
And I stop and think, oh my God. Global health, extreme poverty, and the inequities of the US education system. Nobody's ever tried to solve such problems before with the resources we're bringing to bear on these problems. So it's not uncommon for me to be reminded that I'm CEO of the largest foundation in the world. That's good. I like big. I like scale. We can have grand, grand ambitions. Scale is good. We can make important things happen. But if we're not careful at this largest foundation in the world, we can fall prey to the undesirable side effects of bigness. Bureaucratic bloat, a loss of nimbleness, a numbing of each individual's sense of personal agency and responsibility. Bloat, loss of nimbleness, numbness. They even sound like side effects. See, this is what happens when you have a physician talk about leadership. <laughs> you know, the point is, while we're referred to as big, or the biggest, I have counseled myself and my colleagues towards an aspiration. I don't want to be remembered in the history books as the biggest foundation. I'd really love to be remembered as the best foundation in the world, measured by the foundation that made a really big difference, that made important things happen, impact. The key to achieving this, I'm convinced, is to focus on exactly what we're all here to talk about tonight. Fostering a true spirit of innovation and translating the results of all these great ideas into real impact. I've told people good intentions aren't worth a lot. I know many people and love working with people with good intentions, but we ought to be held accountable for real impact beyond those good intentions. And so for me as a leader, this fierce wish to make an impact has two dimensions. An internal dimension about the organization that I lead, and an external element. And I want to talk to you about both of those. Now, as you all know, being here at this wonderful college, there's what you do within your own organization. That's the internal part. But then there's how your organization shows up in the world and how that world makes an impact on you. That's that external part. A leader has to start with internal. If you want your organization to be a force for innovation and impact in the wider world, you must establish an organizational culture that is radically conducive to those values. Otherwise, you're just kidding yourself. You can't go to work every day and experience a culture that's inconsistent with the impact on how you want to change the world. <coughs> so a leader's quest for innovation with impact begins with how he or she manages people. That is such a central interest for me. In fact, it's become a passion. When Bill and Melinda Gates introduced me to the employees of the foundation in a town hall meeting set up in our headquarters, I told the audience who asked me, why'd you come up here, cold and wet? You're not from Seattle? And what I told them is what's true now nearly a year into my job as CEO. I love being around smart, talented people. What makes me happy and is thrilling for me is the thought of myself as a leader, anything I can do, all my energy focused on bringing out the best in all that talent and all those people in service of the great mission that I'm honored to oversee. If I can set an environment that brings out the best in people, I'll be really proud. I won't make the invention that solves something. I won't figure out the strategy. But if the environment allows others to do that, then I'm sure we'll make an impact. Now, now not quite a year on, I still see bringing out the best of our talent in service of our great mission as the essence of my role as CEO. But that's a really nice thing to say. How do you actually do that? What does that mean, bringing out the best in the talented people? Well, I think it all starts with fostering a sense of individual ownership. Each person has to feel like what they do matters a lot. 
I, I had a great experience in this front uh, at Genentech. When I first started at Genentech, there was a lot of moaning. Stock price was flat. We had a little bit of a dry run on product development, and we, we love to moan and grow. And I started walking around telling my colleagues, you know, we run this place. And they would look at me like, what? I had just come from a very large pharma company to a 2,500 person company. And the thought that we were in charge, I just thought was amazing, outstanding. And when I said to everybody, you know, we run this place, it kind of stops the whining. If you don't like it, fix it. If you don't like what's happening, suggest a solution. And that's a frame of mind I hope to instill at the Gates Foundation. It's, it's my way of saying my individual contribution doesn't just matter, it's definitive to the future of this organization. I'm going to make sure we do great things. And by the way, you are too. That's a totally different feeling than the man is deciding something behind some curtain that dictates my fate. And I think that's the frame of mind you need to have if you want to innovate or create work that generates impact. We run the place. What are we going to do to change the world? So a huge part of that for me is something that I've only learned over time. And that is encouraging people to be who they are, to be authentically themselves at work. Now, you might say, OK, being yourself at work, what does that mean? That sounds like California speak. I've spent too long at Berkeley and all. <laughs> but no, I actually mean it. If you want to instill the message that an individual's contribution matters, you need to signal very clearly that who they are is all they need to be. You can't have a pro-innovation workplace if people are wasting mental energy on pretending to be someone they're not. Now, your president has been a leader in bringing attention to the phenomenon of imposteritis. There's a disease for you. Imposteritis, in which individuals who appear very successful actually feel like imposters or frauds, like they somehow don't match the requirements of the role they're in. So I remember first thinking about a CEO, and my vision of a CEO started with being male and powerful. Remember Jack Welsh at GE? But I have nothing in common with Jack Welsh, <laughs> happily. Um, <laughs> but here's the thing. Great leadership is bringing out the best in yourself, no matter who you are and who you're like. I think one hallmark of a well-led organization is that it does everything it can to demonstrate to its people that, yes, they belong there, that they are accepted for who they are. A leader has to model that from the top, that you accept yourself as you authentically are, and that you don't need to be something you're not. You didn't get a personality transplant or some upgrade to become the leader of that organization. In fact, I'd say the biggest leadership lesson for me so far has been that you don't need to change to be a great leader. That, for me, is very reassuring. It's, a, it's the best anti-anxiety in the world. If I tap into anything good about me, I can be successful as a leader? Well, surely I can do that. I wondered about this. And as I grew in my career and began taking on more responsibility, I worried a little bit that I would have to be somebody different or change my basic nature to be an effective leader. As it turns out, the answer was, in fact, and is, in fact, no. And that's a wonderful thing. It gives me a lot of energy. It gives me a lot of confidence to just show up with all my faults and flaws and do my best to lead. So one reason that it's so important to demonstrate this acceptance of people and who they are, starting with yourself, as a leader is that failure, failure is such a fundamental part of innovation. I wish it weren't. You simply can't innovate without taking risks, and you can't take risks without experiencing failure sometimes. It's important for a leader to signal that his or her organization is an environment that encourages the right kind of risk taking and accepts that sometimes when you answer questions, the answer is no. 
That drug doesn't work. That new technique isn't better than the old technique. In fact, you didn't help the people you were trying to help. There are a lot of ways a leader can send that signal. Now, as many of you know, um, I have two great bosses, our co-chairs, Bill and Melinda Gates, and I have another third trustee, Warren Buffett. It's a pretty awesome set of folks I get to do with it, by the way. Uh, so I got to talk to Warren Buffett soon after I became CEO, and I wanted to probe him for something that had been just written in the Wall Street Journal. It was about an approach that he and his business partner, Charlie Munger, very strongly advocate. A trust-based system in which you hire people you trust and then give them broad leeway within a relatively limited set of controls as opposed to a compliance-based system that relies on lots of internal rules and controls. I kind of like this trust-based versus this compliance-based. That sense of acceptance and trust has to be accompanied by a spirit of accountability and high expectations. I don't know about you, but I remember as a kid, the last thing I wanted to do was let down my mom and dad. And I often wonder, how did they do that? How did they put the onus on me and not them? That's a trust-based <coughs> culture. And here I had another great influence as a leader, and that is my boss at Genentech, Art Levinson. He had a huge influence on me as a leader. In the best of ways, he would demonstrate to me something super special about any manager and leader, that he was going to keep raising the bar for what he wanted from me or what he expected from me. In fact, sometimes I'd feel like yelling or swearing at him. But he was seen always completely confident that I was up to it, even when I wasn't confident myself. It became clear to me that if you're trying to lead people towards genuine achievement, towards innovation and impact, you're not doing yourself or them any favors if you're being nice, if you underestimate them, or it's just too easy on them. It's better to say, I'll bet you're capable of more. I'll bet you're up to it. And yet I am going to ask you to do hard things over and over again. But you're up to it. That's a special leadership trait that I'm really grateful for. So as you might guess, by moving over to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, I haven't exactly given up on the habit of working with leaders with high expectations. I seem to be a serial uh, enabler of such leaders. But part of what makes Bill and Melinda Gates so successful and so special is they do have very high standards and high expectations for themselves, for me as CEO, and for our entire organization. And you want to live up to those, especially when the mission is so compelling. Of course, high expectations can run both ways. You need to not only challenge your people, you first have to start by challenging yourself. What you're really after, if you're serious about innovation and impact, is a culture that welcomes the right kind of conflict. I'm not afraid of that, and neither are Bill and Melinda Gates. I think, as a scientist, that real truth comes out of messiness. That there's a part of inventing, and there's a part of innovating, where you fail, where you don't know the answer, where no one knows the answer. And that's where I think diversity comes into play. A diverse, disparate perspective, everybody working off one another will lead us to the truth. I love it when someone zigs as everyone else zags. That's special. And it can lead to ending up in a better place. So I like to give the example from medicine, peptic ulcer disease. When I did my medical training, we thought peptic ulcer disease was caused by stress. It kind of made sense, you know, stomach acid, stress, burrow brow. In the early 80s, a couple of Australian doctors found that no Peptic ulcers are actually caused by Helicobacter pylori bacteria. And boy, did we make fun of them. We said, everyone knows it's stress. What are you guys doing? You're crazy. Everyone knows stress causes ulcers. But those crazy Australians turned out to be right. They gave us a far clearer sense of what causes ulcers and how to relieve patient suffering. 
all of what this really comes down to, in the end, is our ability to tolerate elements of discomfort on all sides. When I'm in a place where I think something really special and innovative is going on, it often makes me feel a little squirmy. Somebody's not going to like it. It's going to disrupt the status quo. Someone's going to get mad and maybe just a little defensive. A leader has to be able to tolerate the individual authenticity of his or her people. Everyone has to be able to tolerate a certain level of failure and lack of comfort and open to the constructive conflict that seeks truth. If you're not able to have this kind of toleration, you're not ready to be innovative or to have a real impact in the world. If you want a work culture in which the answer is always yes and everything succeeds all the time, and everyone is good enough all the time, you're playing a small ball. And your progress will be minor at best. So internally, I think you want to set up that kind of culture, a culture that accepts and rewards that kind of disruptive zag. But what about external? What about the world beyond your organization? We all get internally focused and think about our day-to-day -day lives and where we show up. But the external world should have a huge impact on how you think about your mission and your ability to make a difference. That external focus is something that I learned in space this year and in 2014. And one of the reasons I feel really good about the Gates Foundation's response to the Ebola epidemic in West Africa. So once we knew the scope of what the world was facing, we had to move very quickly as a foundation. We didn't work in West Africa. We actually didn't do, have any programs in West Africa, and we didn't work on Ebola. But we were able to quickly set up Emergency Operations Center with our colleagues in Nigeria, identify where to send the resources, and we were committing towards an emergency response and health system support in the affected countries where literally the first of our grants went out of the foundation in less than 48 hours. We began working with partners on accelerated development of vaccines, other medications, and diagnostics. And through all of this, we had to put aside purely internal questions of where does this fit in our org chart? Whose job is this? Because the fact was, it was no one's job. And yet it was everyone's job. We set aside our day-to-day -day normal life and focused instead on the external reality. People were dying and many more would die, and we needed to get going. And that's exactly what we did. It was a great example of how we could spur innovation and have significant impact in an immediate, tangible way. But that short-term, acute, quick response can also play out against longer time frames. As you may have seen, Bill and Melinda Gates recently put out their new annual letter. They copied this in a really positive way from what Warren Buffett does for Berkshire stockholders every year. Bill and Melinda spelled out an innovation-driven approach to global health and development. So if you did miss it, you should check out <coughs> gatesletter.com. But there's a big bet that Bill and Melinda put out in this year's annual letter that I really like. Their big bet is that the lives of people in poor countries will improve faster over the next 15 years than at any other time in history. So the lives of poor people will improve faster in the next 15 years between now and 2030 than at any other time in history, and their lives will improve more than anyone else's during this period. Central to the attainment of that goal will be breakthrough innovations in health, agriculture, banking, and education. This includes the development of products, specifically vaccines and other medical technologies that serve the world's poor. The most effective engine of product development is the business sector. So we know that as a foundation. We like capitalism. Even though we're not for profit, we're not against profit. Nothing else matches capitalism. It's combination of capital resources, responsiveness, and sheer ability to deliver. I used to say when working at the Uganda Cancer Institute, if I get cancer, I hope someone thinks they can make money by solving my cancer. I just love that sense of urgency. 
I'm all for a big heart, but I love urgency. Companies have an understandable incentive to focus on products that can make money. They owe it to their shareholders, their investors. So how do you circle that? When I'm working on things that affect the poor, and people in private companies want to make money, there seems to many people a huge disconnect between those two. So I understand this dynamic very well as somebody who worked in private industry for 16 years. Also as somebody who worked as a leader in academia and now at a large philanthropic organization, I can tell you I'm increasingly excited about the potential for creative collaboration across sectors. And I'm increasingly convinced that such collaboration holds the key to unlocking the capacity of business and the business world to solve the problems of the poor. That key is a new way, a sort of version 2.0 of what has long been talked about, this public-private partnership. So agreements among companies, government agencies, and philanthropic foundations can result in funding streams that reduce market risks in the case where there's a market failure and serve to free the business sector to unleash its capabilities. These partnerships can take different forms. There may be direct equity investments or volume guarantees. Tiered pricing might be the tool. Public-private partnership is an entire field of organizational innovation into and of itself. We're looking for new tools, new ways to innovate, and it's a field that I think will become even more important as the economic and social benefits of such collaboration are more widely understood. For me, it's a central tenet of sustainability. If the business lasts, then I know somebody with passion for the cause will continue. So let me give you a real example of an innovative, high-impact public-private partnership. Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance. So Gavi pools the demand for vaccines from the world's poorest countries and provides predictable, long-term financing to meet the need for vaccines in those poor countries. The existence of Gavi has spurred manufacturers to offer vaccines at unprecedented prices. In just a two-year period, 2010 to 2012, the cost of immunizing a child with pentavalent pneumococcal and rotavirus vaccines went down by 35%. Now, have you guys heard a lot of lowering of drug prices lately? That's pretty astounding, 35% in that two-year period of time. Since its inception, Gavi has helped low-income countries reach an additional 440 million children. These children have received life-saving vaccines and averted an estimated 6 million deaths. Our foundation is a major supporter of Gavi. In fact, we provided the 750 million initial seed grant to help set it up. Now recently, Gavi was in the news. Bill Gates was in Berlin for the Gavi Replenishment Conference where he pledged 1.55 billion, that's billion, billion, from our foundation as part of a successful fundraising round that met and then exceeded the goal of raising $7.5 billion for Gavi. As I told Warren Buffett, that's leverage. $7.5 billion. It's estimated that between 2016 and 2020, this infusion of funds will allow low-income countries to immunize an additional 300 million children, saving between 5 and 6 million lives. That's just pure, straight-out saving lives in one of its most efficient forms. So it's hard for me to put in words something better than translating innovation into impact than Gavi. And that's financial engineering impact and a public-private partnership. We've even begun to see the benefits of such partnerships in addressing the Ebola epidemic with the development of GlaxoSmithKline's candidate Ebola vaccine. We teamed up with a group of international agencies and nonprofits to see GSK with grants and other support to help product development move forward much faster than it would have otherwise. But our foundation wants to go forward with this in an even more important way as a catalyst of innovation. We want to expand the global pool of innovators and shorten the interval between the development of a good idea and the achievement of real-world impact. Just over a decade ago, our foundation launched an initiative we call Grand Challenges. Grand Challenges is a program that defines big, important, hard problems 
and offers grants for innovators who come up with good ideas to address those problems. In the years since this started 10 years ago, others have picked up on this. In fact, USAID and even other countries like Canada now have grand challenges. At the Grand Challenges annual meeting last year, then USAID Administrator Raj Shah, who's a Gates Foundation alum, mentioned how central the Grand Challenges model had become to USAID's work. He said that work that normally would have been bid out to the usual 10 or so contractors had attracted 4,000 independent proposals from all over the world. A challenge focused on saving lives at birth garnered 2,000 proposals from 102 nations. While it's terrific to get a lot of great ideas from a lot of different places, that's not enough. You have to translate those ideas into usable products. So the practical aspects of product development, design, manufacturing, distribution, delivery, are so important that we've become explicit in including those challenges as grand challenges. And so we have grants now that focus on that delivery, that making it happen, not just the great idea or invention. We're encouraging applicants to make sure they're building these elements into their planning, for example, by lining up industry partners. The objective is to translate an idea into real products for real people living in sometimes really tough circumstances. And many of our partners are doing a superb job of that, providing models for how to innovate with impact. So one of our closest partners is right down the street in Seattle, PATH, a not-for-profit global health research company. They work with a very clear focus on the people who would actually be using their technologies. So PATH places a huge premium on design simplicity, a simplicity that takes a lot of hard work. Complexity is easier than simplicity. Do you guys find that here too? <laughs> so tough. So let me give you an example. The Uniject system is a small plastic bubble attached to a needle. Not rocket science, you guys. This Uniject system is so simple that a health worker can learn how to use it after less than two hours of training. It's precisely filled with a single dose, ensuring that the correct amount of drug is delivered and that none is wasted. So this is a meaningful introduction and a meaningful change for frontline healthcare workers in poor countries. Finally, there's another reality of innovation that we and PATH and our other partners try and keep in mind constantly. And that's the need to bring those good ideas out into the field as soon as possible. And we've all seen the cost of delaying global health innovation during the Ebola epidemic. But the problem is much bigger than Ebola. Think of it this way. I talked a moment ago about Gavi, the vaccine alliance. One of the reasons we're big funders of Gavi is that it puts a heavy emphasis on addressing the forgotten killers of poor children, pneumonia and diarrhea. So just think of this, pneumonia and diarrhea are largely preventable illnesses. These two, all by themselves, account for the deaths of about two million children every year. Two million preventable deaths every year. That's about 5,500 kids on an average day, every 24 hours. When you think about the passage of time in those terms, it should make you restless to innovate and to seek impact in a hurry. As leaders, it's our duty to create workplace cultures that deliver that kind of innovation, that kind of impact, and that sense of urgency. And then it's our further duty to share those innovations and deliver that impact as broadly, as thoughtfully, and as swiftly as we can. Maria, I'm really glad you invited me to come and address this audience tonight. And it's been my pleasure to meet some of your great faculty and students today. Um, I hope you have some really hard questions for me this evening. And uh, I not only have enjoyed being with you, but I look forward to the innovation and impact that the leaders in this room and the future leaders in this room are going to cause. Uh, thank you for having me join you here tonight. Thank you.